So hi everyone, welcome to MedTech Innovator Live. Uh, this is a webinar series that we produce every summer uh, covering topics relevant to the healthcare industry. What's really unique about our series, um, about this episode and all the episodes that we do, is that all the, all the questions that are submitted, um, or that I asked today, were submitted in advance by the early and mid-stage startups in our current cohort. So they represent the real questions and the real issues that the small companies are facing today. Uh, today's topic is around regulatory strategy, and so I'm joined by an expert, or a panel of experts, um, let me start by introducing our folks from the FDA CDR, CDRH. Um, I'll start with Murray Sheldon. Um, maybe just give us a little bit of your background and your role over at CDRH. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody. This is Murray Sheldon. Um, I'm currently the Associate Director of Technology and Innovation at the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health. Um, just to let folks know about my background, um, I was an active per, uh, practicing cardiac surgeon for 20 years in Northern California. Then I began developing medical devices in the Silicon Valley area for about 10 years before I came to join FDA at the end of uh, 2012. So I've been there about six or seven years um, and uh, I'm seeing a lot of uh, great uh, changes taking place at FDA. Um, Mostly, it's about the change in how we've approached our interactions with companies and how that we brought patients into the conversation as, as, as a primary source of information and data. I'll just stop there for a moment. Good morning. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, from there, we'll move on to Joshua. Hi. Good morning. Uh, my name is Josh Nipper. I am the uh, director of... Um, pre-market uh, support um, in the Office of Regulatory Programs. Um, this is the group that oversees the um, uh, operations and logistics of all the pre-market submissions. Um, I have been here at FDA for almost 17 years um, and started as a pre-market reviewer um, with one of our fellow panelists, Kwame. Um, so uh, I've uh, worked my way up a little bit um, and I uh, was a pre-market branch chief for a while um, and most recently had been the director of the PMA program. Um, and then back a couple of months ago, um, took over the director of all pre-market operations. Great, thank you, Joshua. Um, in addition to our folks from the CDRH, we also have two uh, former FDA reviewers who are now um, regulatory consultants. So I'll start with uh, Kwame. Thanks, thanks, uh, Catherine. I'm Kwame Ulmer, I'm the principal at Ulmer Ventures, and our aim is to work with MedTech innovators and bring the best people, processes, and tools together to help them bring their products to life. I started uh, my journey in MedTech as a reviewer at FDA. I was fortunate enough to evaluate cardiovascular devices, work as a branch chief in the ophthalmic devices division, and ended my time at the FDA evaluating a range of products. Uh, but spent a lot of time working with the group that evaluated dental devices. I was fortunate enough to uh, take on a role at a medical device business uh, in the dental space. I did that for about three and a half years, uh, working in regulatory and quality assurance in markets throughout the world. And uh, more recently, about two years ago, I launched a regulatory strategy firm where we work with companies who are trying to understand the regulatory path, trying to de-risk the regulatory path, and need a guide through the pre-submission process or need someone who can conduct a quality review of their document before it goes to the FDA. So I'm fortunate to spend a good portion of my time working with startups in the MedTech ecosystem in that way. Great, thank you, Kwame. And last but not least, uh, Netta. Good morning, thanks, Catherine. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to be speaking with all these ex FDAs and current FDAs. So I've worked closely with um, Josh and with Kwame. Actually, Kwame was the first person who interviewed me, trying to get me into the cardiac group at FDA. Um, but I chose to go to plastic. Sorry, Kwame. <laughs> anyway, so I am the Chief Strategy Officer for Experian Group. Experian Group is headquartered out in San Jose. 
We are a regulatory, clinical, and quality uh, consulting firm. And we believe that you need all three in order to get a quality product to market. Um, and in my role, I work with a lot of the startups, especially in the Bay Area. But we do also have some of the more traditional med tech um, uh, uh, companies, as well as the less traditional tech companies trying to make their way and navigate their way into the medical device um, ecosystem and through FDA. So I'm excited to be here and uh, eager to hear about the conversation. Great. Thank you to all our panelists. So um, to kick things off, I thought we would start broadly and just kind of talk about trends that we're seeing in the regulatory environment. Um, so Josh, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. Um, what are some of the biggest trends that you're seeing, uh, particularly in the U.S. regulatory environment? Thank you. So I think some of the things that we've been noticing, and I'm going to speak primarily on the PMA side of things, um, some a little bit on the de novo as well, um, is an increasing reliance on real-world evidence and real-world data. Um, we're seeing a lot of submissions coming in where, um, you know, the uh, sort of historical notion of a randomized clinical controlled trial, um, you know, with two arms, um, we're, we're not seeing that. We're seeing situations where companies have been mining um, registry data to expand indications for use. Um, there is some reliance on literature. There's some reliance on um, OUS data, uh, but we're really seeing um, a lot of submissions come through um, where it's, it's sort of a non-traditional clinical study or clinical data being submitted. Um, it can certainly save um, you know, time and money on the industry side, but of course, you know, we're running into challenges of how we interpret that information and uh, wanting to make sure that it's being collected um, in a manner in which we can interpret, it, interpret both you know, effectiveness results, but also adverse events, um, you know, get a, a, a real safety profile for that. Um, I would say the last, you know, six months to a year, that's the biggest uh, shift I'm seeing on the PMA side. Great. Um, and uh, Netta, maybe, um, you know, you're not working at the FDA anymore, but you are working a lot in this space. So, you know, any trends that you're seeing in particular? Sorry, you're a little, you're muted there. Muted. To unmute you. There you go. Can you hear me now, okay? Yes. Perfect. So I think the biggest shift we've seen with FDA is this trend to benefit risk. Um, they're putting the benefit at the start of our decision-making process. So we always want the benefit to outweigh the risk. And FDA is really trying to focus their resources and their attention where there's a higher risk uh, related to the device. Um, and as Josh said, also, there's this, uh, this move to try and make sure uh, clinical studies are being conducted in the U.S., i.e. with the introduction of the early feasibility program. That's not so new now, and I think FDA has gathered a lot of experience working in that program and learning um, to try and encourage manufacturers to conduct their studies here. Where we, we, we are big proponents of that, and for our clients who want to go and do their first in man or their second in man out of the U.S., we try and say actually FDA is establishing these pathways to work more collaboratively with especially early startups um, to help develop their product here. And it's really more applicable to the patient population within the U.S., the clinical climate. And, um, and I think uh, this approach of thinking of coming to the U.S. first rather than um, going out of the U.S. In, in, in considering where to conduct your clinical study and how to go about that. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Netta. Uh, and thanks for letting me know about the muting. <laughs> um, so that was a great, great overview. Um, before we move into some of the more specifics, I thought we could clear um, some of the uh, terminology. So Murray, I'll, I'll direct this question to you. Um, you know, is there an official difference between clearance and approval? Yes, yeah, sometimes uh, some folks get a little bit confused by uh, some of these terms. Um, clearance uh, we use specifically uh, when we uh, allow market authorization for a product that follows a 510K pathway. And mm -hmm. approval is the term that we use for products that get market authorization through a PMA uh, pathway. 
um, perhaps Josh could uh, um, amplify on that a little bit as I, I, I may have mentioned in my introduction, I'm not a reviewer nor have I been a reviewer. Um, my focus is really on uh, policy and barriers to patient access. Um, and and I just like to amplify one other comment on the trends. Um, as, as you've heard from uh, Netta and, and Josh and others, um, FDA, at, certainly at CDRH, is a changed uh, institution uh, for the last five to 10 years with a tremendously altered increase in um, trying to drive innovation um, and especially patient access in unmet needs for high risk disease states. So I think you'll see FDA working more closely um, with companies to uh, help get these uh, innovative products to patients. Uh, we also wanna help get them covered and reimbursed as well. Um, and so our focus is really on the patient and healthcare. Great, thank you. I was just yeah. saying, on the specific question, um, Murray is correct, 510K is, uh, <clears throat> we refer to clearance for under 510K and approval is essentially limited to PMA and HCE. Um, when something is FDA approved under the PMA program, um, it often has additional, um, you know, post-market requirements, um, often conditions of approval to either complete a post-market approval study, um, but there's additional um, additional regulatory requirements under the PMA and HCE pathways, including annual reports and um, supplemental applications for manufacturing changes and things like that. So um, typically the approval is um, comes with a little bit of additional regulatory burden for companies. Um, I would throw another term into the mix, not to confuse anyone more, um, but when we have a de novo, um, we refer to those as being granted. Um, which means that we are um, approving essentially the de novo um, with special controls um, and creating a new regulation um, in order to allow future companies or future um, submissions um, to use the 510k pathway. Great, thank you. Um, so let's start with some of these questions that were submitted by our companies. Um, you know, most of them are, are curious about how they interact with the FDA and, and the appropriate way to um, to do that and, and to approach those conversations. So, uh, you know, Josh, maybe I'll start with you there um, since you're, you're a current reviewer or you have that most recent experience there. Uh, sure. So, I mean, I think um, the, the main message I would like everybody to get is when you're talking, at least with CDRH, um, when with respect to communication, um, early and often is really the best advice I can give. Um, you know, we, you know, our staff exists here to help guide companies through that regulatory pathway. Um, I, you know, the questions that I saw ahead of time, there were a lot of specifics on, you know, should we come in preclinical, postclinical, before, you know, regulatory pathway. Um, and I think my best advice is if you have questions pertaining to any of those situations, you know, reach out to FDA. Um, you can start with an email or a phone call to a reviewer or the management structure if you don't know. Um, they might ask for you to submit a QSUB. You know, we'll answer some pretty basic questions on phone or email, um, but you know, submitting that uh, QSUB is a great way to get your foot in the door and let us know um, what your device is, what your regulatory plans are, what your preclinical and clinical testing plans are. Um, you know, we, uh, we will provide written feedback, we'll provide meeting uh, feedback. Um, we stand by our written feedback unless there's, you know, significant shifts in public health or in scientific knowledge. Um, so it can be a great way to get that early feedback on, um, you know, how to start your development or um, if you're most of the way there to touch base with FDA before you submit. I mean, PMAs are um, a very high user fee and a long regulatory process. And it's, it's better to know if there's going to be a problem earlier in that process than, you know, three months after you submit and get that major deficiency letter. Yeah. And, um, maybe Kwame, you could talk a little bit more specifically about, um, pre-sub meetings. Um, you know, when's, when's a good time to do those? Um, you know, are they really worthwhile? Yeah, I, um, I, I think about this question a lot because on occasion I'll meet with an innovator who, um, quite frankly, has concerns about it being a trap uh, and then being locked into feedback. But if you flip that, just as Josh mentioned, what it is is an opportunity to de-risk 
the development path for your product and be a good steward of most likely the investors that are backing uh, your endeavor. So practically, what does that look like? You know, I would say you probably want to start the conversation with at a minimum a draft indications for use, a draft device description, and a draft set of claims you want to make. And the more specific your questions, the more clear and crisp the feedback would be from the FDA that you can then take to refine your development path as a, as a young uh, innovator. I, I, at the risk of sounding like a bit of a salesman, I wrote 10 reasons why it makes sense to talk to the FDA. Uh, those are some examples, um, but there's really limited downside and uh, a lot of upside in getting the feedback uh, as early as you can. Uh, and those are a couple reasons why it makes sense. I would, I would also just like to add that um, we're big proponents for pre sub but remember FDA is not a consultant. So you really need to go in uh, with a very clear set of questions that you want FDA feedback on. And as Kwame said, it really does start with your intended use of the patient for you, which speaks to your claim, and then that device description. If you can't get back to FDA and you can't be clear about the questions, they won't be able to give you meaningful feedback. Um, and it is a process as well. There's a time aspect associated with um, submitting a pre-sub. And it, you, if you want to meet with FDA in person, it's not going to be out until potentially 75 days from when you submit that package. Um, so it has to be a pretty robust, well put together package if you being able to explain what your goals are to FDA so that they can engage with you and really provide you the input that's going to help you further develop your product. And just in, in line with what um, Josh said regarding PMA, definitely if you're going down that class three pathway, you should be engaging with FDA a lot earlier. But we also highly recommend it for de novo. Because there, as, as he spoke to earlier, you're developing special controls, you're creating a brand new classification, um, you're having to come up with those mitigation measures. So it's definitely really important to be speaking to FDA sooner than later. And most de novos require clinical data to support that granting, that clear, eventual clearance. Um, so you want to get FDA's input on that study design and your bench testing sooner. Um, but you do need to have it uh, kind of tightened up. Don't just go asking very broad questions because it's not going to be meaningful for either side. Great. So that, yeah, that kind of answered one of the questions our companies had about the appropriate timeline. So it seems like if you're going um, after one of those those pathways like uh, de novo or PMA, the earlier the better, um, even before preclinical testing is, is good. Um, Kwame, maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about advice um, for companies if they want to get some feedback or high level feedback on their device classification and path and they don't want to go that pre-sub uh, route. Is there another way to get um, that kind of feedback? So um, thank you, Catherine. I, I have a couple thoughts and I'm sure Josh uh, can add or subtract to what I say. There is a very uh, formal path to get feedback on the regulatory path for your device and it's called the 513G process. And there are timelines associated with that. There's a fee associated with that. And quite frankly, I, I meet with innovators who want that formal feedback through a process that was specifically designed to get, get insight in the FDA's current thinking on regulatory path. And they can say, look, I went through the very specific process to understand the regulatory path from my device. This is what it is. And this is how long it's gonna to take to get to market. There's another, um, there are some other ways you can talk to the FDA. Clearly you can pick up the phone or send an email to a deputy division director, division director, or branch chief. Um, and then there's a 1-800 number, <laughs> you know, there's still a good old fashioned 1-800 number that you can use. Now you'll, I think the practical reality is um, you'll get a range of specific feedback depending on which tool you use but those are some additional examples of literally how you can get some high level feedback from the FDA. And, and, and Josh may have some additions to what I said. Yeah, all, all great uh, feedback and, and perfectly correct answers. Um, you know, I would note 
the for the the pre sub um, process, um, FDA will we're not really supposed to give definitive answers on regulatory pathway. Um, we will often provide feedback on that. So if you know a company is coming in and saying, you know, we're we're clearly a five ten k and here's our plan, um, and you know we've approved three PMAs for that in the in the past, um, you, you'll likely get feedback on that regard. That being said, um, the pre sub or the Q sub pathway is not the correct um, pathway to get a definitive, you know, you are a class two or you are a class three device. Uh, that is the 513G program. As Kwame said, it is a formal program. Um, it has a 60 day review clock. Um, and um, under that pathway, um, that's when we, FDA, will give the, um, the general idea of where your device fits within class two or class three. Um, if it's class two, or we believe it may be class two, um, whether or not we've identified a product code for it, or it might um, be more appropriate under the de novo pathway. I will say um, when coming in with that, as um, some of the feedback or uh, answers we've gotten earlier, um, I absolutely agree with, you know, you should have your in uh, intended use uh, well developed. You need to know what you're treating, who you're treating, um, how the device is, is working. Um, often, you know, we do see sponsors come in and they propose um, something, but we're not quite sure what that something is, and they may not quite be sure what that something is. And so you may get feedback of, well, you know, based on this, we, you're looking at a class three indication, um, but if you tweak that a little bit or you change the patient population, um, really depends on what you're looking for. Um, maybe we can develop special controls and put that in de novo. So um, I would echo the feedback earlier to really think through the patient population um, you know, what the device is going to be doing, and even in a 513G, which are usually quite small applications, you know, 10 or 20 pages, um, that should be well spelled out. You should be explaining to the staff who've never seen your device before, um, you know, what is this thing? What is it doing? Who's it benefiting? What's the benefit risk profile? Um, and if, if you're not aware of a predicate um, and you're looking to go de novo versus PMA, you should be thinking about how or why we can develop special controls to put in place in order to mitigate any risks available. Great. Um, and just to kind of, before we leave the subject of interacting with the FDA, um, Josh, you know, what would be your advice on bringing general counsel into these discussions? Is there a point where it's too early? Um, should it just be an open discussion? Um, so that's a good question. Um, I would actually turn that to some of our industry colleagues a little bit to see what their thoughts are. Um, you know, my biggest advice would be to, um, to know why you're involving general counsel. Um, if you're coming in and you're, you know, um, a startup and you have no device and you're really just looking for FDA feedback um, on, you know, the protocols for bench testing, and that's the extent of your feedback, um, you know, there are exceptions, but I don't know that general counsel is necessarily going to be needed for those types of questions. Now, if you're coming in and, you know, you've gotten feedback that FDA thinks you're class three and you really think you're class two, um, you know, I, I've seen benefit to having somebody who's kind of gone through the process and can explain pros and cons um, that way. So um, it's a very good question and one that there's not a, a solid answer to, but I would, I would ask uh, Kwame or Netta um, what their thoughts are on that. Netta, do you want to start? <laughs> Go ahead, Kwame. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think... Um, you, be, you begin with the end in mind, and if you have specific objectives that have some legal uh, aspect to them, then you may want to consider uh, bringing in counsel. But there's something, I think, underlying the question, and I, I think I saw it in a couple of the advanced questions, and I want to address it. So, you know, FDA is a, is a collection, a group, a team of consummate professionals that are fact-based and science-driven. And they apply that science to the regulations. And the argument, whether it's coming from a regulatory affairs consultant or a lawyer or you know, someone else with another background, the argument is the argument. And there is no outsized impact from having a lawyer from large law firm XYZ if they're saying the same thing that someone with a different background is saying, you know, so I wouldn't put a lot of stock in if the underlying pretext of the question is, if I get this white shoe law firm X to come in with me, will that give me some sort of advantage? 
on the, on the face of it, I think the answer is no. I think what gives you the advantage is having a solid argument, irrespective of who's making that argument. Um, and those are my thoughts on it. Uh, begin with the end in mind. If there's, there's, a, there's a specific question and expertise needed by a lawyer, bring them in. If not, don't invite them and save those billable hours for when you really need the lawyer. Yeah, I would 100% agree with Kwame and with Joss's sentiment. It's all based on the science um, because it's a science-based agency. Um, you need to show them the evidence. So I actually found it that sometimes when you do use the large law firms that might not have that expertise within the technical or scientific realm, um, uh, the approach regarding your strategy and potential pathway doesn't always line up. Um, and I, I no tell here, but I think you need to go to someone uh, who knows and understands regulatory. And we found that where there is some technical expertise there. Again, as the product developer, you are the expert in your device. FDA doesn't want to be the expert, but they understand the regulations and their mandate is to protect and promote public health. So if there's concerns there, that's where those questions are coming from. And I think having working with a partner who understands that mandate, who understands the regulations, regardless of background, but I do find where there is technical expertise, scientific or engineering, you do put up put forward a stronger argument or rationale based on the science um, that can convince FDA to agree with your approach. Great. Um, okay. And so let's let's talk a little bit more specifically about the regulatory pathways and, and we'll focus first on, on some of the, the more common um, 510K. Um, you know, what, what are the major pitfalls that are often overlooked for a 510K device? Um, so Josh, let's start with you there. Um, so I think the, the number one pitfall, if I could, uh, if I identified something is is really just not doing uh, research and homework on the predicate device. Um, I've seen situations, you know, where a company comes in and they um, they just sort of picked a predicate device, you know, at the most recent clearance, or they just picked one out of the list. Um, and when the reviewers sit down and they do that comparison of A to B, um, you know, they're 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 different devices. They use a different technology. They're different sizes, and that raises a lot of questions that you possibly could have avoided if you had picked a different predicate or picked something that was more akin to um, the proposed device. Um, the other thing is, you know, we're um, admittedly, you know, years, decades ago, our 510k summaries were fairly sparse. That has been um, an effort that we've really been trying to improve upon and get more information out both for um, patients using devices, but also, you know, for, um, for companies looking to, to do a comparison. Um, you know, I've seen examples where a company comes in and they have their device and we ask for clinical and they submit um, that pre-sub later saying, you know, how are we supposed to know? And when we pull off the last five predicates and they've all had clinical studies and they're explained in the summaries, um, you know, that's putting that company at a huge, now they're, they're four months behind on, on getting their device to market because, you know, they, they should have started that study six months ago. Um, and, and that's just, it's lack of, of predicate research. It's lack of kind of market research to see what else is out there. How do I compare? Um, if you've, if you've got a difference in your device, you know, if everybody else was wired and you're moving to wireless or Bluetooth or what have you, um, that, that may be okay. It could be perfectly fine. It could be better. Um, but that needs to be justified. It needs to be tested. It needs to be explained thoroughly. Um, because those are things that are going to stand out to our staff as, Someone said, you know, we have a lot of um, very detailed engineers. We have um, scientists that, that love to do a comparison and they love to see, um, you know, the differences, um, but they will ask questions about those differences if, if it's not well explained. Um, so I think that's, you know, at the surface, that's the biggest pitfall I see is just not, um, not doing enough research on the other products and the, the kind of regulatory history of the product space. And Kwame, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the differences between a, a 510K requiring clinical and a de novo application, and then also kind of just talk a little bit more about what, what the de novo pathway um, is. 
So um, in general, uh, the 510K application is going to be a more straightforward process because there have been devices that have been on the market that the FDA has deemed to be substantially equivalent and there's a history and a, a track record of preclinical and clinical data that would be needed to establish a risk benefit profile, a safety and effectiveness profile. And the contents of a 510K have been spelled out for many, many years in the pathways just well trod and a lot of the information to put together an effective package is publicly available. A de novo by definition is new. And you by definition will be talking to the FDA, an applicant will be talking to the FDA to design the right clinical data to be granted a de novo approval. And that level of complexity on the face of it will be more than going through a traditional 510K um, because there could be a scenario in which as a company, you don't think you need to go through a pre-sub, even if your 510K, which a lot of 510Ks do require clinical data. But by definition, if you're going through the de novo process, you will be engaged probably in multiple rounds of conversations, probably realistically over several months uh, to design that clinical data set that will support uh, safety and effectiveness and being granted. So those I think in, in, in broad strokes are the ways you should think about a traditional 510k with a clinical data set versus a novo process. You have to go through a risk benefit analysis um, and really you have to make sure that your entire set of labeling, et cetera, accurately and adequately characterize the product. Um, and you're doing this with limited predicates to base uh, your decisions on. So those are the two big differences. Great. Uh, and that also, is, yeah, go ahead. There, I was just going to add on to where the pitfalls are um, of a 510k. 100% agree with Josh, not um, having done your research and your homework as relates to an appropriate predicate. Um, starting with one that has to have the same intended use. If you don't find a predicate with the same intended use, you kind of are going to have a lot of difficulty navigating your way through the 510k uh, pathway. The other piece we see actually is, and regardless of what your pathway is going to be, is not taking into consideration a, uh, the need to develop your product under a QMS or quality management system and how important that is. And that really speaks back to developing a system that's appropriate for the risk associated with your product. So it always starts with that risk assessment. Um, so I think uh, developers need to be thinking about that in the back of their mind. And it's not, a, it's not a simple or easy task. You can submit your 510K, you can go down the regulatory pathway, but when you get that clearance, you only have 30 days to have that uh, appropriate level of quality system in place, um, and you want to make sure it's appropriate for the risk associated with your device. So I think it's kind of an afterthought we see with a lot of um, startups specifically, but it's something you need to be thinking about early on if you have to manufacture for good manufacturing practices, if you have to have a device history file um, and um, get appropriate controls in place. So it's just something to put out there. It's just you are speaking to regulatory counsel or, or, or consultants um, who don't raise that up or ask you that question, you should be thinking about asking that question. What level of quality management system would I need to have in place? Great, thank you. Um, and then to, to kind of move on um, with uh, a de novo versus PMA, you know, what, what are the advantages uh, of the de novo pathway over a PMA if there's no predicate device? Um, Kwame, maybe you could answer that question. You know, uh, and I, I am open to being corrected or amplified. You know, I think there's a little bit of a misconception that you pick your pathway. Uh, PMAs are, by definition, the highest risk devices that need the ro most robust clinical data to make sure they're safe for human use, period. And depending on your indications for use and your device description, you are 
I think it's going to be pretty clear that either you're a PMA or you're a de novo. My understanding of de novo is they are typically moderate risk devices. And um, the only way you can drive in one direction or other is if you intentionally choose a high risk patient population or a higher risk profile that would bump you into the PMA world. So I don't think of it in terms of picking your pathway. You have a device, you have an intended use, you have a device, device that has a certain set of capabilities and the pathway comes out of that. That's the way I think about it. Um, and one typical path that I see with digital health folks, particularly in Southern California is they actually want to start with a low risk product that maybe is considered a wellness device as a version one, gain some traction, and then version two, more moderate risk, and maybe try and design a device that is appropriate for the de novo path uh, for marketing reasons, for funding reasons, et cetera. And that's the only way, again, I think you can determine your path. Your, your path is determined um, based on those set of facts and the risk benefit profile. Yeah, I would like to jump in, and I think Kwame is, is absolutely correct. Um, you know, we've had multiple situations where a company has submitted a PMA, um, and we have done a screening of that PMA, and, and usually before even filing it, have reached out and said, look, you know, we think these risks can be mitigated with special controls. We think uh, a class two is a, a better fit for you. Um, and then almost every situation, the company is, is on board with that. Um, I would say even if they're not, if FDA feels strongly that uh, we can mitigate the risks, um, we can still push a file into de novo should we need to. Um, so to some extent, you know, it's not a, a pick A or pick B, it's really where the risks of the device fit. Um, and, you know, again, the big question as to whether or not a de novo can be um, approved or granted is, can we develop special controls to fit that? Um, you know, the vast majority are, of de novos are low risk or moderate risk devices. There are a few that, you know, if you go through the de novo approvals, um, there's a few that are, that, you know, you could easily make the argument that it would fit under a high risk. But in those scenarios, we felt, you know, these risks are understood. Uh, we can put a special control in place to make sure that the company is, you know, doing appropriate bench testing before marketing or in certain situations, um, actually verifying with clinical. Um, you know, collecting new clinical data can be a special control we can put on for new devices or new versions of the device. Um, and so that's really the question at the heart of FDA's review is, you know, can we put a special control in place to mitigate the risk? And if so, we're going to try to push that down to class two because it, it does... Um, it increases access uh, for patients. It increases access for other sponsors for um, additional innovation. Um, as far as some of the other benefits, I mean, I think the question is broad. Um, you know, class three PMAs have post-market requirements. They have uh, post-approval studies. As I mentioned earlier, they have supplements required when manufacturing changes are, um, are needed. Whereas once a de novo is granted, if you need to make a minor manufacturing tweak and you, it's not a design change, you can do it under Part 820 without really telling us. Um, you know, PMA, you've got to wait 30 days before we approve that change. Um, and that's just, you know, that's kind of one example, but it, there, are, um, there are definitely benefits for a company down the road, um, you know, being in the class two bucket. Now, I will say, you know, I've heard some, from some companies that there is a uh, an exclusivity concern. Um, you know, once you're a de novo, uh, other companies can come in and be equivalent. Um, if there's no clinical data needed, um, sometimes your competitors can copy your device pretty quickly. Um, and, um, and there may be a rash of 510Ks coming um, in your same product space. Whereas on the PMA side, you know, you'll often see we'll approve one and won't get a, a me too for three to five years. Uh, and I do know some companies, um, you know, kind of want that window of um, market exclusivity in order to build up their brand and build up their product space. Um, but again, we wouldn't make our de novo versus PMA decision based on that, that company desire. It would really be based on the risks and whether we can control them. Great, and, and so we haven't heard from uh, Murray in a little while, so I wanna bring him in, in the conversation and switch gears to talk about the break to, uh, breakthrough device pathway. 
uh, you know, this is a very interesting um, kind of uh, program that's not quite well understood. So Murray, maybe you could talk, us, talk to us a little bit about that. Sure, thanks, Catherine. Um, I want to give just a little bit of background uh, to the Breakthrough Program because it essentially started in about 2012 with the Expedited Access Pathway. Um, what we were recognizing uh, at that time was that we really didn't have a lot of tools in the toolbox to um, improve patient access and to shorten the time and cost of development so that patients could get um, innovative uh, medical products. Um, and, and the breakthrough pathway actually started primarily for PMA devices. And this came out of the initial innovation pathway that FDA piloted with um, end-stage renal disease uh, challenge uh, to really develop a different methodology of interacting with uh, companies uh, to develop their products. And there are certain principles. Um, the first principle was um, to really try to lower the time and cost for product development, um, as well as the uh, uh, clinical trial uh, necessities. Um, the second principle related to developing a um, collaborative view of development of the product with the company so that FDA and the manufacturer um, or the developer would really share the same approach to how we get this product to patients um, in an expedited way. And the third was to make decisions that would only carry forward momentum so that if FDA was asked a question about whether we can approach it uh, in way A and we felt no, we wouldn't just say, no, you can't do that. We won't accept that. We would say, no, but it, this could be an alternative that you could consider so that we would at least open uh, new doors if we uh, closed others to carry forward momentum. So the expedited access pathway um, came out with a uh, uh, guidance uh, document, I believe in 2014, I may be off a year or so on that. And then as we were working through that pilot and lessons learned, we started looking at a uh, second approach, which is to balance the pre and post market data collection, recognizing that there is a significant advantage if a product is safe and effective with um, getting it to a patient as quickly as possible, especially for life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating conditions uh, where there were no other alternatives or no other um, uh, good alternatives. And so we felt that um, we might increase our level of uncertainty at the time of pre-market approval to get the product to a patient and then balance um, other uh, data collection in the post market. Um, and we came out with a, um, the expedited access pathway um, guidance uh, along with a breakthrough, uh, excuse me, along with a pre post market balance uh, guidance in 2015. Um, then came along 21st Century Cures Act and the concept of breakthrough um, uh, therapies and frankly, all of the uh, uh, medical product centers at FDA, the drug and biologic and uh, uh, device centers um, developed their own version of breakthrough. Um, the, the biologic uh, center and the device center uh, shared uh, their guidance to the extent that biologics also uh, regulate uh, some devices. And this came out to be the breakthrough devices pathway and it's based on all of the history and the same kinds of um, principles that were uh, developed early on in the expedited access pathway. And it um, uh, continues with the notion of uh, appropriate pre post market balance uh, data collection. Um, and it, it's turning out to be a, a really good uh, program. It also comes with um, um, senior uh, management uh, of your product. It comes with expedited and priority uh, review of your product. 
uh, by the FDA review team. Um, and recently, um, there's been some proposals uh, through CMS that we've been working along with them uh, to do two specific things. One is to help to provide some level of coverage of these products. If it's gonna be marketed um, uh, with a little bit of increased uncertainty in the pre-market, um, uh, generally payers have great difficulty in providing coverage or, or payment for these products until that other data is collected but we recognize that that may take some time and we do want patients to have access to these products if they have a life-threatening disease and this may be the only product to help treat that condition. So um, CMS has developed a coverage with evidence development program that we're trying to uh, develop the uh, presumption that they will have CED for this product as well as a new proposal for uh, new technology, excuse me, automatic new technology add-on payments um, for these products, all in an effort um, to really create patient access uh, to these very, very new innovative products for life-threatening diseases. Thank you, Murray. And um, to, to go off of that, you know, not to play into the misconception that, you know, a company can pick what pathway um, they're going down, but uh, you know, how does a company determine if they're eligible or if they, they qualify for a breakthrough device designation? Um, you know, Murray, is that something you could answer or maybe Josh or, or one of our regulatory consultants can answer that as well? Well, I'll, I'll start with it and then pass it over to Josh because uh, uh, his review branches would be making the final determination. Um, the, the, there, there's very specific criteria and it's all spelled out both in the guidance document for uh, the FDA dev breakthrough devices uh, program as well as in the federal register uh, when it was put out. And I believe the date for that breakthrough was in, I, I think there's a new one came out in 2019, just a couple of months ago. I'm not positive about that. Um, but the first criteria is, as I mentioned, that it has to be a device for a life-threatening, um, to either diagnose or treat a life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating condition. So um, getting breakthrough technology designation does not um, apply for a product that um, um, just is trying to improve how you feel or how you look or some other way, this is for a real life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating condition of which, you know, we, we can, it spans the uh, spectrum um, in, in healthcare, uh, cancers, cardiac disease, end-stage renal disease, things like that. Um, and then it also has to meet a one of four secondary criteria that really have to do with um, uh, differentiating that product from other uh, products that might be um, applicable for diagnosis or treatment of that uh, condition. Um, uh, the first being, of course, if there is if there are no products, so a, a real unmet need. But there may be other products or other approaches that can treat that condition. And so for qualification for breakthrough designation, you have to demonstrate that this will be um, um, better substantially better than the alternatives that are there. Um, it also comes with the notion that this needs to be a novel technology, something that perhaps we've never seen before or a new methodology to utilize the device in a different way. Um, and, and there's also a catch-all um, uh, condition that we put in there that is directed at patients um, that essentially says that um, the company and FDA believes and agrees that this is in the best interest of patients to utilize this particular uh, device. So th these criteria are spelled out. Um, however, um, the company doesn't determine that they get breakthrough status. Um, you request that and you write out your explanation for these different uh, criteria. And then the review team uh, we'll look at it and uh, compare it to other products that have been granted um, 
uh, breakthrough designation, and we actually have a breakthrough uh, team that kind of spans the spectrum and uh, can advise a particular review team if they wish uh, about um, whether this actually meets the criteria or not. Um, maybe I'll stop there and ask Josh to uh, give some examples of uh, how this has worked out. I mean, I would say that's all correct. And, and I would, as far as the criteria go a step further, um, it's actually spelled out in the act. Um, the, um, um, you know, the specific criteria to meet breakthrough um, is actually in the law. Uh, guidance provides a little bit of um, interpretation or a little bit of context around that. Um, but, you know, the, um, the flexibility around the criteria um, isn't really there because it's actually spelled out, you know, by Congress in the act for us. So, um, so that's what we rely upon. Um, you know, all Murray's points were correct. I mean, it's, you know, you're looking at life-threatening um, or, you know, debilitating disease type scenarios. Um, you know, where we see a lot of the, the questions come in are um, offering substantial benefit over something that exists. Um, you know, a, a cardiac device comes in and, and there's, you know, a handful of devices already in the market to treat that. Um, and I think, you know, some sponsors come in and they say, well, we just, you know, we're new, we want to be breakthrough. Um, and, you know, it's really up to the sponsor to make the case on why that might fit. Um, you know, does this really offer a substantial benefit compared to existing technologies? Um, you know, is it in the best interest of public health? Um, we've had a few of those examples that we've granted. Um, you know, sometimes it's a slam dunk and we see that, yeah, this, this is great. This is way better than what's out there. And other times they look a lot like Me Too devices where, you know, the company wants the, the breakthrough status because as Murray said, it, um, it moves things to the top of our review queue. It gets a lot of involvement from um, the uh, division and OHT management, um, as well as, you know, some uh, interest in, in some of the senior management within CDRH. Um, but, you know, it has to fit and it's up to the companies to really make that case as to why the breakthrough designation would fit. Um, we do have specific Q-subs for breakthrough requests and breakthrough follow-up. I would say that if you, you know, want to discuss the breakthrough questions prior to submitting the breakthrough request, that's perfectly on the table. Um, that can be done, you know, in, in one of the standard Q-sub formats. It can be done as a specific Q-sub to come in and say, you know, look, we were considering breakthrough. What are your thoughts? What are the pros and cons? Um, these are all things that FDA can discuss. It doesn't have to be a a surprise to us that, you know, all of a sudden a company comes in and says, hey, we want to be breakthrough. Um, you know, I think let's have that conversation um, and, and figure out what's in the best, uh, the best plan uh, for an individual company or technology. Yeah, I'd also like to jump in here. We, we submitted a number of breakthrough um, requests and successfully had them granted. I think the key aspect, and Josh uh, indicated to this, is in that first criterion. You have to have provide for more effective treatment or diagnosis. Yes, it's life-threatening or debilitating, uh, irreversibly debilitating condition. But if you're not more effective, that's where you're going to get that pushback from FDA because we've seen it. So there has to be some initial technical potential success for te a technical success as well as the clinical success aspects. So if you don't have some evidence that relates to that as well, you're going to have a harder time getting through that breakthrough piece. Uh, and we've seen it also shift slightly. I, I don't know if you can speak to this, Josh, but earlier on when the program came through, there were a lot of breakthrough submissions that were granted. Now, and again, I know it's very dependent on the culture and which group you're submitting to, but I do think FDA, especially with the guidance going final, you're right, Murray, it was in April 2019, earlier this year, um, that they become a little bit more stringent in terms of how they're looking at that, th those criteria. Um, and especially the first one, if you're not showing you can be potentially more effective, because there's a lot of, like you said, a lot of other products out there that can be approved and you don't have to be novel, you don't have to meet all four criteria. Um, but that effectiveness piece, then it's very hard again to go through to the next step of criterion two. So this is Kwame, I, I would also um, 
as a founder, be prudent in my allocation of time and how many, how many calories I would want to burn on a breakthrough designation because you can be a wildly successful company, reach a lot of patients, get to market and, and drive uh, uh, capturing market share without that wonderful breakthrough designation. It's a relatively new thing and companies have been successful before it. They've been breakthrough before that, that imprimatur. So uh, I would just think through trying to squeeze a round peg into a square hole, whatever the expression is, uh, because you have a limited amount of time, limited amount of capital to get your product to market. Um, so be prudent with your time and, and going through that process. Yeah, all good comments. And I would, you know, reiterate what Murray said. I mean, breakthrough in and of itself is new. I think the big changes um, when we move from EAP to breakthrough is the concept of applying it to de novo and a very select few 510Ks. There, you can be um, both breakthrough and a 510K, um, and that was new. Um, but before that, we had the EAP, and to be frank, before the EAP, um, we had uh, priority review PMAs, um, and those date back to, I think, sometime in the mid-90s, where we could designate a, a, priority, re uh, a priority review for PMAs and panel truck supplements. Um, so, and they used many of the similar, if not identical, criteria. Um, and so, you know, some of this isn't new. Um, some of it is, you know, at least the interpretation. Uh, to Nada's comment, I, I can assure you no, um, you know, a CDRH-wide email went out to say be more strict in the breakthrough. Um, but I can say that, you know, as the process matures and as we um, learn more and, you know, navigate the process more, um, we are careful about, you know, if, if everything is breakthrough, then nothing is, right? Um, not everything can be at the top of our queue. Um, and so we are trying to, you know, balance and prioritize, um, you know, what's coming in. Um, and truly trying to, you know, capture the, those that uh, really may have a, a, you know, a positive impact on the healthcare market. Great. Thank you, everyone, for comments on the Breakthrough Program. Um, so for the last topic, uh, you know, I thought we would jump down and talk a little bit about uh, the FDA CMS parallel re review. Um, Murray, I know this is something that you have knowledge in, so maybe you could talk about how that process works and if it's a good idea for our startups to be thinking about. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it, it's actually uh, very interesting. Um, again, a little bit of history. I think it's important to know where a lot of these things have come from. Um, but one of the major issues that most people don't uh, grasp because it's, it's very device specific, we don't see much of this with drugs, is that uh, payers uh, don't necessarily uh, provide coverage and payment for a product that FDA approves, even if it's a PMA where there's been lots of data and lots of time and clinical studies to look at these products, FDA approves it, puts it on the market, and a payer uh, may say, uh, well, that's great that the FDA has determined that the uh, product uh, is safe and effective, uh, but it doesn't meet their criteria uh, that it needs to be covered or paid for by the insurance company. Um, while each individual insurance company has their own approach um, uh, and they're all often proprietary, uh, we tend to look at what CMS does. First of all, they're a sister agency. Second of all, they're a public uh, uh, payment organization and coverage organization. And many private companies follow CMS's approach. And their definition of whether a, a product will have coverage uh, and payment is whether it is reasonable and necessary. Those two terms, reasonable and necessary, have tried to be uh, defined um, approximately four times unsuccessfully uh, each time. Um, so we don't really have a firm definition of uh, reasonable and necessary. And, and frankly, when you look at FDA, um, while we say a product must be safe and effective, we don't say it needs to be absolutely safe and effective. We just require, and it's all statutory by law, a reasonable assurance of safety and efficacy and how you interpret that reasonable assurance and how you determine whether a product is reasonable and necessary is uh, you know, really at the discretion of the agencies and, and, and we go on the basis of how what we've learned about these products over time. But um, if we're focusing on patient access, 
it, it requires more than just FDA uh, market authorization uh, in general, unless they're for very unique products where a patient may pay for it out of pocket, um, that uh, uh, insurance coverage and payment is necessary. And in order to make that approach work better, we started to partner with CMS. Uh, the concept actually developed uh, back in 2005. And in 2010, um, we entered into an MOU between the FDA and uh, CMS uh, to pilot uh, the parallel review program. And it was piloted exclusively in the um, device center. Uh, so it's primarily a uh, product uh, parallel review for medical devices, not so much for drugs and biologics. And the whole point of what we were trying to accomplish with parallel review was to say that uh, based on um, how CMS does the work, and by the way, parallel review has only one outcome in terms of the payer, in terms of CMS, and that's a national coverage determination. So um, the national coverage determination is a nine to 12 month pro uh, process, again, by law. Um, and to shorten that time, um, we felt it was best once a clinical trial data had been developed uh, is to share that data with CMS immediately and to have review of both the safety and efficacy, um, uh, reasonable assurance by FDA and whether the product was reasonable and necessary review by CMS to occur simultaneously. So that meant that we would be reviewing that data in parallel. Well, we had a few companies that applied and we learned some lessons about this. And one of the biggest lessons that we learned was that it often doesn't work unless a company works very closely with both FDA and CMS prior to development of their pivotal clinical trial where they're collecting data, because if they were to be collecting data for FDA that won't meet the level of concern for CMS, at the end of the day, CMS says, well, you know, we really can't assess this. And it could be as simple as um, not enrolling enough uh, patients that represent Medicare beneficiaries into the clinical trial. You know, in a lot of cases, uh, patients over 65 are excluded because they have confounding uh, diseases or other um, issues that may muddy the water in a clinical trial. And so patients over 65 are excluded or very few are uh, enrolled. CMS simply cannot make a national coverage determination if the product hasn't been uh, tested or a clinical trial, including substantial numbers of Medicare beneficiaries. So we learned that there needs to be uh, initial discussion and initial planning of that clinical trial with CMS and FDA together prior to developing the um, uh, clinical trial design. And so in uh, 2016, after we learned these lessons, uh, we then uh, put out a, a version two of a parallel review, uh, taking those issues into consideration and added the uh, uh, prior communication. And what we've utilized for this is the FDA pre-submission process. So what we've said is that a company who is interested in parallel review and or um, uh, including a payer uh, within the uh, process to get their input on what might be necessary is when they come in for a pre-submission meeting with FDA, it would be to invite uh, CMS and or a private payer to that meeting so that uh, we, we can they can understand feedback from both uh, the regulator and the payer about what data may be necessary. Um, this isn't for every product and it, it, it certainly increases the complexity, but at the end of the day, for the products that have worked through this system, uh, we have demonstrated that you can get FDA approval of your product and a national coverage um, tracking sheet uh, placed uh, uh, simultaneously um, and uh, 
un unfortunately, or, or whether it's fortunate or not, the, the rules for that is there's still, it would be at least a one or two month um, delay because CMS requires public input on any proposed national coverage determination. But it does reduce the time um, um, on an average of nine to 10 months uh, to patient access. Um, there's more I can talk about on the private payer um, uh, approaches, but this is what I'll, I'll stop here for parallel review. That's great. Thank you, Murray. Um, really excellent overview of, of this process. And like you said, there's a whole bunch more we could go into this, but I, I want to kind of end the public broadcast and give our companies a chance to ask some questions. So um, before we sign off that, uh, I wanted to give each of you kind of a, an opportunity to say any last words or any last piece of advice for the companies. So uh, Kwame, I'll start with you. Well, I would uh, keep your laser-like focus on using your time to get through the regulatory pathway as efficiently as possible. Um, and try and surround yourself with the team of experts that can help you do that. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can engage the FDA, pick the ones that are most effective for your purpose uh, and um, execute and get those products to patients. Uh, Josh, how about uh, we kick it over to you? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess my final parting comment would be the one I made earlier, and that is um, when, when communicating with FDA um, early and often, um, you know, I think it, it is, I, I strongly believe it's in your best interest to, um, you know, to map out any um, long-term project plan with FDA to talk about what the testing preclinical and clinical expectations may be. You can have regulatory pathway discussions. Um, you know, and if you're not getting the clarity you need from FDA to reach out. Um, you know, one of the comments that, um, you know, I've heard from various other conferences I've spoke at is, you know, maybe you, um, you know, you're a little confused from a uh, feedback from a lead reviewer, or maybe you don't quite agree. Um, you know, don't be afraid to, um, to circle or, or loop in the branch chief, which we're now calling assistant directors after our reorg. Um, but we have management here to help you. Um, my staff within the Office of Regulatory Programs can also um, greatly assist at getting you, know, getting you in touch with the right people, um, be that you know, someone from the breakthrough um, program that, that Marie alluded to earlier, or bringing in QSUB expertise, um, things like HDE, where we only see two or three a year. Um, companies often have you know, questions that sometimes our staff are a little bit um, fuzzy on. Um, so reach out, you know, communicate with FDA, let us know your plans. Um, if you're not getting the feedback that you need, don't be afraid to speak up, raise your hand and say, look, you know, we, um, you know, we're a little confused by this. Can you help us out? And um, if the lead reviewer can't, we will find people that can. Great. Thank you. Um, Netta, how about you? Do you have any last piece of his, pieces of advice for our startups? Sure, so I, I think, remember FDA is a public health agency. Their, their mandate is to protect and promote public health. So in telling your story, especially in pre subs it's good to keep that patient and the public health aspect at the forefront. Where we sometimes, where I've actually found, and I think Experian Group has found um, startups or groups to be most successful as they develop their products and move through that regulatory pathway is when they have a key interest in how it's going to impact patient care and improve outcomes, or if it's addressing a actual uh, pain point for physicians or practitioners or patients. So in developing your product, you should really be ad answering an unmet need, um, something that needs to be improved because at the core of everything we do, I think regardless of where we sit within the med tech ecosystem, I think the driver is getting better products out to market faster to actually improve health outcomes. Thank you, Nada and Murray. Um, you're the last one to, to give advice. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, it's re really a 
two minor things in follow-up of everything that Josh, Kwame, and Nata ha have described. Um, the first is that um, while FDA is a regulatory agency, I often don't really consider us a regulatory agency. I consider us a healthcare agency. We're here to improve public health. How we do that is through regulation. Regulation is a process that we utilize uh, to both uh, protect and promote public health. And we're here to do that and to help patients uh, get well in their health journeys. And the second thing I'd like to emphasize is that when a company is developing a product, it's their product and they know all about it. Um, and FDA is learning about it secondhand. And it's critically important to really tell your story to FDA, to really take FDA review team and the FDA staff through your journey of what you've done and why and how and how this will be improving uh, uh, public health and patient care in some way. So learn how to tell that story and to really explain it well to FDA and your path uh, through regulatory process will definitely be paved. Excellent advice, Murray. And thank you to all of our panelists today. I think I did uh, the math and there's well over 50 years of uh, experience uh, on the panel. And so I wanna thank you all for your time. Um, and so that, uh, that concludes our webinar four. I'm gonna ask the panelists to stick around and if anybody has any specific questions, um, they can raise their hand now and I will invite them into uh, the call.